over to Korea and take a look at the Korean market. So Kospi there is gaining by around 1.4% right now, 1,629. Taking a look at the currency now, the currency reaction, of course, to the BOK, leaving rates on hold for a seventh straight month at around 2%. The central bank has said that the economic recovery is still very much in the early stages and inflation is stable, but the BOK has refused to rule out uncertainties that continue to hang over the economy. Well, Daniel So is regional economist at Forecast. He joins us now from our studios over in Singapore. Uh, Daniel, great to have you with us today. Uh, we, of course, have seen the BOK leave interest rates unchanged, which was pretty much as you expected uh, them to do, but I guess the focus really on the commentary. Uh, uh, what are you looking for from the BOK? Mm, that has been in recent in recent days or session that we have seen the treasury market actually starting to factor in at least a 25 basis point height as early as November or December. But I still maintain my view that uh, BOK is unlikely to rush into nominalisation of interest rate until the first quarter of 10. That's a great point because uh, among the initial comment, analyst comments that I saw right after that interest rate decision, five out of five said they only expect an interest rate hike uh, in the first quarter. And what is interesting to note is that we're actually just getting commentary right now from the Central Bank of Korea saying that there can be cases in which the policy is deemed to be on an easing bias even after interest rates are raised. So the BOK now already talking about interest rates. Why are they doing this? Mm, I think they are trying to boost their credibility because if you look at the fundamentals or if you look at the performance of Asian economy, South Korea and China or maybe Indonesia will be one of the first few to, to, to normalize the interest rate. And there have been talks about uh, excessive uh, liquidity driving up asset harbor. So they are trying to show, to convince the market that they will do certain things if necessary to, to contain inflation. But if you look from, from the broader perspective, deflationary gap is still huge in South Korea and, and they, they are unlikely to use uh, monetary tools to tackle suppose, tradable inflation due to the rise in oil prices. So, and private consumption and investment are still fragile, so I don't really see a, a, a rush or a need to, to raise interest rate. And of course, the most important thing is the South Korean won, which has boost the economy during this global financial crisis and they may lose some of this competitiveness if uh, the dollar fundamental weakness come in and especially for the yen. So policymakers have to factor in all these things to, to do uh, their monetary policy adjustment ahead. What was interesting to note is that uh, in fact just a few days ago we had conflicting comments from the finance ministry and also the top run state run think tank which is actually affiliated to the finance ministry, the KDI, finance ministry saying we need to keep these easy monetary policy rules in place. On the other hand, the KDI saying no, 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 the government needs to start tweaking those rules. Why are we getting conflicting signals, c c signals, considering that they're actually part of the same family? I don't think the signal is conflicting in the sense that the finance ministry is trying to say that uh, an exit strategy in terms of focusing on rate we we'll have to come looking in line of economic development or economic uh, recovery from a global perspective. Our KDI is talking about more of emergency measure financial rather than specifically rate policy. Mm. But a lot of the things that they have done, uh, they should actually start to unwind them. So it's more of an um, emergency pressure, emergency measure from the KDB perspective and maybe slowly into rate normalization while the finance ministry is just trying to say that, oh, we should keep rate low and the easting appropriate. So KDI people just doing their job, basically. Uh, yes. Uh, Daniel, let me jump in here and uh, ask you about the Taiwan, the Premier's uh, surprise resignation that we had earlier on this week. We haven't seen too much impact. A lot of analysts are telling me that there isn't really going to be too much of a long-term political or market impact, in fact, from this move. Uh, uh, but I guess, does this mean, it, does this mean that cross-strait relations are actually going to be able to improve over the longer term? Mm, pardon, I can't, I can't hear a last uh, question. Does this mean, Daniel, that uh, cross-strait relations are going to improve? Uh, yes, of course. I mean, the, the, the newly appointed uh, Premier Xi actually said that they will stick to prede predecessor policy and also aim to improve cross-strait relations. So this will allay, allay concern about any uncertainty to policy orientation or the geopolitical tension across the, the cross-streets. And you can see uh, from the portfolio search in portfolio equity inflows into the Taiwan stock market over the last few sessions. So foreign investors are trying to to assess the, actually the significant spillover effect of a financial agreement with across the street. And that's actually, I will say that uh, I'm very, actually very bullish for, for Taiwan stocks and for the Taiwan economy as a whole. All right. Daniel, look, great to have you with us today. Unfortunately, we're out of time. Thanks for joining us. Daniel So from Forecast.